Once again, it is a privilege to be here to be asked to bring the Word of God uh, to you. Let me give a brief uh, recap of what we looked at yesterday morning. We looked in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we looked at the what we were calling as a sort of a heading, uh, the situation, which is we are the church in the world, that's chapter 1, and then sanctification, especially the first few verses of chapter 2. And the third S we want to look at uh, as we close uh, this evening is suffering. And we read from the 8th verse of chapter 3, but we're really beginning from verse 13. And we have three uh, main points that we want to uh, consider uh, tonight. And the first one is, and I think this is a very important one to state, uh, and there's much application, I think, positive application in this, and that is suffering is not an absolute state for the believer in this world. Notice what verses 13 and the first part of verse 14 says. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake? In other words, the Apostle Peter is not by any means assuming that the Christian life will be always filled with suffering. There's nothing wrong with living a normal life. There's nothing wrong with living a peaceful life. In fact, there's many scriptures that not only countenance this, but promote this idea. In 1 Timothy 2, where Paul exhorts that prayers be made for various ones in authority, the reason he gives in the second verse is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. But the reason why I say this is so important is that I fear that there's some at least who promote the idea that unless we're suffering, unless we're being persecuted, there's something wrong with us. You know, we're not quite in the front lines of the Christian army if we're not being, you know, getting stones thrown at us or, or someone hating us, that there, there's something wrong. No, the Scripture, as I've said, not only countenances the idea of living a quiet and peaceable life, but actually promotes that idea. We should not be looking for trouble as Christians. That's not to say that we completely avoid it if we're called to it, and we'll get to that in our second point. But it's not to be our goal. And I think this has been exacerbated by the internet because there are some that seem to go on the internet and they talk about their sufferings quite a lot. And, you know, it's a bit like the, the giving of a testimony. You know, somebody gives a very dramatic testimony and we feel less Christian because we don't have a dramatic testimony like that. Well, that's not scriptural. We don't have to be persecuted. God calls us to a normal, quiet, peaceable life in Christ Jesus. So I want to really emphasize that. And, you know, Romans 12, verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, That ye study to be quiet, do your own business, work with your own hands as we commanded you. See, the, the apostle is not telling the Christians, you have to get out there in the world's face and, 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 and hassle them so much that they will turn around and persecute you. And then you'll be confident that you're a real Christian. That's not the emphasis of uh, these verses that we have read. Of course, that's not to deny that, and as I said, our second point will cover that, that there is persecution for Christians. And many Christians suffer persecution. But I want to really just emphasize this initial point briefly, that that is not the norm from a biblical point of view for the believer. Our second point, when suffering does come, 
It is the will of God for our good and glory. Look what it goes on to say, verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. In, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 23, when it talks about persecution, that when men shall hate you and separate you from their company and reproach you and cast you out and cast your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day. And listen to what it says. And leap for joy. When it's, when it's done through and in the will of God, there, there's something special. God has a, a special blessing for us. Yes, there, there might be times when God calls us to go through times of suffering. These exceptional times. And the Gospel of Luke tells us, and the Lord Jesus tells us, in that day, leap for joy. It's not something that we've looked for. It's not something that we've sought. It's something that God has sent for a greater blessing to our soul. And I'm sure many of us have experienced family, friends, maybe even Christians, treating us in a way that is Not good. And God uses these things to make us more like Christ. To conform us to the image of Christ. We see this even in in the life of the Lord Jesus. He did not seek arguments. In fact, quite often he walked away from the arguments. But when those times came, they were used in him and they are used in us to conform us to his image. Philippians 1, 29 says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Blessed suffering. Now, the point being, it is suffering for his sake. It's not because we, and Peter deals with this in later verses, not because we are annoying, not because we are, you know, we do things that deserve suffering, but suffering for his sake. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10 says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches and necessities, and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. We read in, in the Psalm 119. I remember reading three of those verses many years ago, and they really impressed themselves upon me. Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. We we can test an affliction by the relation it has to between us and the word. Does the affliction, does the persecution, does the suffering bring us closer to the word of God? The Psalms themselves become wonderful counselors and comforters in affliction. Because David, prefiguring the Lord Jesus Christ, experienced much suffering. And here the psalmist says that affliction in this context had the benefit of enabling him and bringing him to keeping the word of God. So he says in verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And verse 75, I know, O Lord, so he's judging the character and and the, the intent of God here. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. See, the Christian, when afflictions and suffering does come, realizes that all things work together for good to them that love God. So 
We're not expecting, as maybe some churches in the world could be in a service like this, and maybe at any moment persecution could literally come through the door. Now, it's very unlikely that will happen tonight. But if it was to happen, if we were to receive tonight persecution and suffering that many do suffer around the world, God is being faithful, even in that extreme circumstance. God has a special purpose for us in that. As I said earlier, we we don't look for that. (laughs) We don't want that. But when it does come, it is for our ultimate blessing. I love 1 Peter 5 Verse 9, you know where it says in verse, it says in verse 8, about our adversary the devil, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But then in verse 9, listen to this amazing verse. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, li- now listen to this. Knowing that the same afflictions, and here's the really good part, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Did you get it? Do you see the perspective of Peter when it comes to affliction and suffering? There's something being accomplished by God in that affliction, in that suffering. God is doing a very particular work through and in that affliction, that suffering for your good. So the devil thinks he's going to destroy us, but God is even using the devil to shape us more into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Sort of as a side point, it it amazes me about the devil that after these many thousands of years, he hasn't copped on. I mean, it it shows you the the folly of sin, doesn't it? You know, it shows you the the, the blindness of sin, that even the devil is so blind that he just goes on and on and on and you'd think he'd give up. Because every time he seeks to tear down a child of God, God is using that very work to mold that child of God more into the image of Christ. The devil is doing Christ's work. Not wanting to do it, but doing it through the the sovereign purposes of God. That's why it's so important, going back to to the first point, that we don't look for trouble Because if we look for it, that purpose might not be accomplished. When it comes by God's will, we can be confident. We can be confident. Our third point is right responses to suffering. Right responses. This is our last point, but we'll spend most of our time on this. Right responses in suffering. There's five of them in verses 14 to 17. We've already considered to some degree the first one, and that is cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. 1 Peter 3, 14. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. James puts it this way. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It's not that James is saying, you you know, ignore the reality. But but measure it and and reckon it as as a, a good thing in this sense, that it produces the trying of the trying of your faith and it's working the very patience of God. In your soul. So I remember years ago someone saying, Be careful when you pray for patience. You know, we, we pray for these things, but we, we don't quite realize what we're doing. You know, make me more like Jesus. What a prayer. It sounds very nice, but what does that mean? Make me more holy. Make me more godly. When we pray those prayers, 
We're, we're really praying to experience many of the things that the Lord Jesus experienced. The hatred of our closest friends, of our family. You know, we said yesterday, none of us like to walk into a room and it's obvious that we're not really going to get a great reception. We, we like to be liked. But when you pray, Lord, make me more like Jesus, in effect, you're praying, make me be one who's despised and rejected in this world and by this world. When we talk about the church and the world, this is what we're talking about. Archbishop Leighton, we were talking about him earlier on, and he was Archbishop of Glasgow in the 17th century. Listen to what he said on this subject. All the sufferings of this world are not able to destroy the happiness of a Christian, nor to diminish it. Yea, they cannot touch it at all. What a statement. It is out of their reach. If all friends be shut out, yet the visits of the Comforter may be frequent, bringing glad tidings from heaven and communing with him of the love of Christ and solacing him with that. Banishment he fears not, for his country is above, nor death, for that sends him home into that country. You see, when the Lord Jesus was leaving this world, He could do no better than to send us the blessed comforter from heaven. The Lord Jesus did not say to his disciples, don't worry, I will give you many friends in this world. No, no, he gave them something far better. A comforter from heaven. The third person of the Trinity, personally sent to them, to comfort them, to counsel them, to strengthen them, to uphold them in all these sufferings that they would endure. So Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see, the point here is, it's not that we're glad because of what's happening here and now. It's what it produces. It's what the final day will bring to pass. It's glory. It's an eye to glory. It's looking to him and looking what will happen when we're with him. So he says in verse 14 of chapter 4, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. What a statement. The spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Like it did the Lord Jesus Christ. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. So when God sends suffering and afflictions and persecution into your life, it is so that you might glorify God. What a privilege. What a privilege. We see we don't really have time to look at the verses. But we see the response, don't we, of of Peter. And the disciples in in, in Acts 5, verses 40 and 42, when they their response to the to the persecution of the, the Jewish leaders. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That, they were, that God would even consider them worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. They rejoiced in this. 
They were happy. They were leaping for joy, as James says. And Paul and Silas in Acts 16 at midnight are singing praises to God. And it's, it's not because they'd gone mad. It's because they'd realized the ultimate end of all these things. That we do not look at the things that are seen. But the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporary. But the things that are unseen are what? Eternal. So the first right response to suffering is cheerfulness. But then the second right response is courage. Courage. Verse 14 of our text says, And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. There's an outward and inward emphasis here. Not afraid of them or anything they can do to those who can only kill the body. And after that, there's nothing they can do. And don't be troubled within. Jeremiah is told, Jeremiah 1, verse 8, Be not afraid, Jeremiah, of their faces. They're only men, Jeremiah. Don't be afraid of them. Why? Why, Jeremiah? Why should you not be afraid of them? For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. I remember when I was young going to school and I went through a period of being bullied and I remember one day going and walking into the midst of the same group and I had one of my older brothers with me and I was completely confident. On my own, I would have been terrified. And God says to Jeremiah, don't be afraid of their faces because Jeremiah, I am with you. And I am with you for the purpose of delivering you personally. My personal agenda, Jeremiah, in your life is to present you holy and blameless and unreprovable in my sight. That's God's God's agenda for all these people, isn't it? God's agenda for your soul is to present you without blame before him in his presence. Why would we be afraid? Why would we, would we, would we be afraid of the, the frowns of men? Of the displeasure of men? When God Almighty has decreed and has desired and has planned and purposed your eternal good. What a gospel. What a gospel. What news, what blessed good news that we have. So Ezekiel is told, Behold, Ezekiel 3 verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious people. And that's what enabled Luther 500 years ago to take his stand. To stand in the face of the, the, the Romanist court and powers. He could take his stand because he knew his God and they who know their God shall be strong and shall do what? Exploits. Maybe one of the problems in today's church is that we're we're, we're looking for men to help us. We're looking for numbers to help us. And and we lack the conviction that all we need is the very presence of God. And when we have the presence of God, we need nothing else. So that inward lack of fear when the Lord Jesus says in John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Trust me. Trust me. 
Don't lose your conviction and faith that I have your welfare at the very center of my plans. Don't judge things by the appearance. Don't judge it by what you will see in the days to come. When you see me upon a cross, let not your heart be troubled. When you see me buried in the tomb, don't let your heart be troubled. Look beyond what you see. When things come into your life that are devastating, let not your heart be troubled. Look beyond. Look beyond the cares of this world. Look beyond the afflictions and the persecutions of this world. Look beyond them. So in Joshua chapter 1 that we read this morning, verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. One commentator put it this way, Expel fear by fear. Drive out the fear of man by the fear of God. How often we see fear expel fear. The fear of being burnt will nerve a woman to let herself down by a water pipe from the upper stories of a house in flames. The fear of losing her young will inspire the timid bird to throw herself before the steps of man, attracting his notice from them to herself. The fear of the whip will expel the horse's dread of the object at which it has taken fright. Oh, for that divine habit of soul which so conceives of the majesty and power and love of God that it dares not not sin against him, but would rather brave a world in arms than bring a shadow over his face. Cheerfulness, courage, and the third right response is consecration. Consecration. Verse 15. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Not so much with your lips, but in your heart. Set God apart in your heart. Make a special place for God. And be ready always to give an answer. See, we have here what I'm calling the root and the reality of consecration. The root is the sanctifying of the Lord God in our hearts. The reality is the readiness to give an answer. So Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6 puts it this way. The same principle, just put in a different way. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. You see how the word of God and God himself are brought together in the heart of the believer. So one commentator says this, sanctifying the Lord God means not making him holy, For he is already most holy, but regarding him as holy, treating him, the idea of him, and all that is his sacredly and in a manner different from that in which we regard all other things and ideas. You see, one of the great problems with the church in the world is that there's not this relationship to God. Because this is the only thing that makes us different. This consecration, this sanctity, this holiness, this relationship to God, this love to God. We can say Bernard of Clairvaux was a bit of a mystic. 
But the one thing we can be convinced of, he loved God. He loved God. And you see, we can be right on so much doctrine, but if if we're not sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts, what's it all worth? What does it all matter? If we're not loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, what does it all matter? On the readiness of this consecration, consider its necessity. Be ready always. You see, what's the purpose of preaching? In Ephesians, it tells us that God has given pastors and teachers and so on for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not this in that context is not the ministry. What you do with this is the ministry. That's what Paul's saying. This is just preparation. I often think a preacher is like, you know, the sergeant major that stands up before the the battle and sort of strengthens the soldiers with words of courage and confidence. That's what preaching is. It's to enable and equip the saints of God to do the work of the ministry. Because we are a body. The devil succeeds when he stops us ministering to each other. When we feel, I won't make that phone call, I'll watch the TV instead. I won't encourage my brother that I know needs a phone call and just say, hi, I was thinking about you and praying for you. That's the ministry. That's the ministry. Living for one another. 58 times this one another phrase is used in the New Testament. One another, the body of Christ. What is the church? It is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. It is the people of God. But then the objective is to give an answer to every man. But the focus is not so that you might know any reference that he might ask you. No, no. It, it's, it's very focused that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. And you know, if you say nothing more than this, my hope is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ raised from the dead. That's our hope. We were looking at that, weren't we, in in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ is not risen, your faith is vain. But Christ is risen from the dead. It is true. He is ascended. He is glorified. That's our hope. That's our confidence. That's our courage. But then, its manner is meekness and fear. We're not arrogant. Passionate, yes, but not arrogant. Not promoting ourselves. Not pushing ourselves. Not like liking to hear our own voice. But glorifying Christ. Lifting Christ up. For if he be lifted up, he will draw a man to himself. So cheerfulness, courage, consecration, and fourthly, so important... Conscience. Conscience. This is when the preacher wants to just skip over this one. Because how many of us can say that we have a good conscience in all things? Having, verse 16, a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, They may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So here a good conscience is assumed as essential in our dealings with the world. So we can look them in the eye. We can look at them face to face. And, you know, not feel we have to turn away with with embarrassment. 
This is why consecration is so important. Consecrate your life so that your conscience may be clear for the purpose that you might be able in meekness and fear to challenge a world that something is wrong with them. It's not with you. Paul could say, if we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of Christ. But listen, if we are in our right mind, it is for your sake. For the good of your soul. And if I could change anything in my life, it would be all the the wasted opportunities that I wasted because I was not close to him when the opportunity came. And I was ashamed. And I missed the opportunity to stand for Christ. To challenge the world. So baptism in verse 21 of chapter 3 is simply the answer of a good conscience. There's nothing beneficial in baptism in itself. It is simply the answer of a good conscience. It is a response to God. It is a declaration that I need to be cleansed from my sins. So Paul, speaking to Felix, in Acts 24, verse 16, says, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So that was the power of Paul's ministry, wasn't it? A conscience completely void of offense toward God and towards towards man. So in 2 Corinthians 1.12, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. It's not something we've developed. It's not something we've grown out of our natural strength and holiness. No, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, word. The grace of God. The danger of forsaking a good conscience is shown to us in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Listen to what he says. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck. Your conscience is not good. You shipwreck your faith. See, a boat that is shipwrecked is still a boat. Get the point? But it's useless. It's useless. A boat that founders upon the rocks is still a boat but it becomes useless. Let us not shipwreck our faith by a bad conscience. And brethren, how merciful God is that he has suffered with us all these years. And his forgiveness and his faithfulness is new every morning so that if you have come here tonight with a a conscience that has been affected by sin and you're, you're, you're entertaining a sin if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness isn't that wonderful you can now at this moment come before God with that sin and confess it before him at this moment Confess that sin. Hate that sin. Bring it before God. And you have cleansing by the blood of Christ. That's why in in Psalm 51, when David prays that he would 
know the joy of God's salvation. And that the Spirit of God would again give that joy to him. Then he talks about teaching transgressors the ways of God. David understood that he had to have dealings with God first. He had to have his conscience cleansed first. He had to have forgiveness and the, and the conviction that God had forgiven him first. So he could go then and reach other sinners. So... Cheerfulness, courage, consecration, conscience. And we got a fifth C, contrast. Contrast. Verse 17 of 1 Peter 3. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil. One of the great understatements of Scripture. If the will of God be so... It's better that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So he goes back to that in chapter 4, doesn't he? Let none of you, chapter 4, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody. Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And then he brings, in chapter 4, 17 to 19, the great context of it all. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Listen, we're here tonight and we feel the fear of God, don't we? We have a sense of the almighty majesty of God. Why is that? Because judgment is beginning with us. There's people at home at this moment, not to say it to be self-righteous or feel smug in ourselves. They're sitting at home, watching the TV, and couldn't care less about God. Judgment and praise God for this. The church in the world, the judgment of God has begun with us. We feel the reality of these things. These are not fiction. These are not fantasy. This is reality. And the world lives its life dumbing down and crowding out the conscience and doing everything it can so that I think... I heard a a, a story, I'm not sure how true this is, but apparently, I think in Los Angeles or something, somebody just put the word eternity on the way in. I think it was Los Angeles, one of the big cities in America. Just the word eternity. And there was a public outcry to remove the word. It was just the word eternity. And people were saying, we want that removed. They don't want to think about eternity. See, the devil's gospel is live for the moment. It's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous be scarcely saved, what shall become of the ungodly and the sinner? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, listen, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as Onto a faithful creator. So, we've considered the five C's of Christian suffering. Cheerfulness, courage, consecration, conscience, and contrast. Let me give you one more. The most important of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, verse 18. For Christ also had suffered once for sins. And just like Christ, if I can say it this way, God calls us to suffer once in this world. One life. As someone once put it this way, only one life will soon be passed. Soon be passed. So I was talking to Mr. Kirkland yesterday or today. I think he's 92 years of age. 92? Yeah. And he said he became a believer over 70 years ago. But his life, just like ours, will soon be passed. 
And, and Peter is saying here that Christ also had suffered once. Now his suffering obviously is much greater and different than ours. But here it's been given as an example. One life to suffer. And Paul could say that these present sufferings are not worthy even to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Wait for it. Revealed in us. In us. The glory that shall be revealed in you. There will be a glory that will come from within your very being. So we won't have to fear going into heaven. You know, like the parable of the the people who weren't dressed for the wedding. You are going to be glorious in heaven. You will be completely at home. We're not at home. We began yesterday morning. We're strangers scattered. We're pilgrims. We're not at home in this world. You'll be at home in heaven. When we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Oh, it is so much. Back to chapter 2, verse 21 as we close. Chapter 2, verse 21. For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Verse 23. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Verse 25. For ye were a sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop. God cares for your soul. God shepherds your soul. God has a divine purpose of blessing to your soul. It's when we forget these things that we run to trouble. May the Lord bless his word to our souls. In the Savior's name. Amen. Let us stand for prayer.